the Aikido Journal podcast. This is your host, Josh Gold. Today we'll be speaking with Guillaume Everard. Guillaume is fifth don in Aikido and third don in Daito Ryu Aiki Jiu Jitsu. He's a French biologist and Budo instructor living and working in Tokyo, Japan. He's extremely knowledgeable about the technical, cultural, and historical side of Aikido and other Budo arts. And as a Westerner who's lived and trained in Japan for years, he brings an interesting perspective to any conversation about the martial arts. Today, we'll be speaking with Guillaume about the Aikikai Hanbu Dojo, his home dojo, actually, as well as the Japanese perspective on Budo and the concept of harmony. We'll also spend some time talking about his Daitori practice. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Guillaume to the podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure, our pleasure. So uh, before we get started, I was hoping you could maybe share a little bit about your background when you, when you moved to Japan and um, any other details about your, your martial arts practice. Yes, uh, so um, after a while, I always wanted to go to Japan, right? Uh, and not only for Aikido, but because of Japan, that, that sort of interest for Japan had, uh, had never uh, left me uh, since childhood. So um, I always thought that I, I was going to go to Japan and to some extent I wanted to become Japanese. I thought, oh, one day I want to speak Japanese and, uh, and perhaps become Japanese national, you never know. And I had that at, at the back hmm. of my mind. But I knew also that... Um, to succeed in doing that, I need to get a job. There was no way that I, uh, I would succeed in Japan. It felt first impossible to do, but I thought if it happens, I'm gonna have to to get a good job. So you need an education, which is why I, you know, I, I studied uh, science and uh, I realized uh, if I want to be employed uh, and especially as a foreigner with you know relatively poor command of the language, I'm gonna need to to make the difference with a with a degree of some sort. So I went all the way up to the PhD, and uh, of course when I defended my thesis, I had to try to convince my uh, uh, examiners that I really wanted to do the science and all that. But in reality, I really wanted to have a PhD to get a job in Japan. Really. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did it, right? Indeed, indeed. And now, uh, in hindsight, I'm very happy I did. Um, of course, I, I went to Japan. I was 27. So that's, you know, that's quite old. I, you know, but I'm glad that I had the patience of doing this because first, I never struggled in Japan. I always got a job very, very quickly. Good job, uh, adequate salary, a lot of time to do Aikido and other things. So I think that's quite important. And also not being too young, uh, I had lived in Ireland, I had lived in England for a long time, so I was more ready in my mind to accept what Japan was and, uh, and not to try to compare too much. And uh, I never got sick of Japan, ever. Uh, and I think that's one of the key to, to, to staying here for a while, uh, is, is that maturity when you come. Otherwise, Japan can very quickly either break you or erase you. Uh, you so want to fit and become Japanese that there's very little left of you afterwards. Uh, and that, that's certainly not something that I want to do. So I think that was quite important. Hmm. Hmm. So tell us a little bit about, um, about Hanbu Dojo. And, you know, a, a lot of the Aikido Journal community uh, is located in North America, South America, and in Europe. And almost every Aikido practitioner has, has certainly heard of Habu Dojo and, and some have visited uh, for, for short periods of time and, and a small number of people for extended periods of time. But I think a lot of people are curious and they, they want to know what's, what's it about, what's it like to train there, what's it like for a beginner, what's it like for a, a more advanced practitioner. And if, if somebody's going to travel there to visit, uh, how, what should their approach be to get the most out of it? Right. So I can only talk about my own perspective. Uh, obviously, I didn't begin Aikido at Hombu. That's, that's a different question. Uh, um, but, you know, of course, you know, going to Japan and uh, doing Aikido, you think of going uh, to, to Hombu. Uh, thing is, I, I was not really a, a member of the Aikikai. I started in the, in the group led by uh, André Noke, who was the first Uchideshi of uh, Ueshiba Morihei. But his group was not affiliated to the Aikikai, so I'd never 
seen uh, an Aikikai Shihan uh, until uh, way uh, after I started uh, Aikido. The only uh, Japanese teacher that I uh, that I saw uh, was Tamura Sensei, of course, who mm. was located in France. Yes, and we were part of his federation, but not uh, on a, in, a, in a different group within that federation. And I still, you know, went to seminars and, and I went to Christian Tissier seminars, who was the other federation as well. But I didn't have a connection with Hombu. None of my uh, teachers or, or, or fellow students ever went to Hombu. Uh, so that was unknown to me. I knew that it existed, but uh, that was unknown to me. It's very, way later that I actually met uh, Aikikai Shihan when I started living in, in Ireland, really. Uh, when I joined uh, a dojo who was started by a French guy, Cyril Lagrasta, who himself was a student of, uh, of uh, within Christian Tissier's federation. And then I saw the, the, if you like, the Japanese side of things and, uh, and oh, that, that, that piqued my interest. And uh, actually, I need to really mention Cyril Lagrasta because he's the one who got me in Japan the first time. Um, he planned a, a trip to Japan with his, uh, his dojo. A uh, few guys from Dublin uh, went there. And he said, oh, you should, given how much Aikido you do, you should really come with us to Japan. Hmm. And I said, uh, yeah, of course, I want to go to Japan. But look, I'm, I'm finishing up my thesis and it's not going so well. And uh, I'm stressed and I don't have money. And, but he, re he really did what, what he had to, to convince me to go. And I, I basically uh, I tagged along um, for the trip. And that was a life ch changer. Um, first experience at Hombu, first experience in Japan. Uh, and uh, then I realized, okay, no, I really need to get my act together to finish up that thesis and to actually go, otherwise I'll never do it. Uh, so because I had that experience at Hombu, then the next logical step was to come back to Hombu. I mean, I enjoyed it so much. I was scared, uh, really scared in the changing room. And, and, I, hmm. and uh, I was completely disoriented uh, in, uh, in, in Tokyo. You know, you know that movie, uh, Lost in Translation? Yes. Um, the, the opening scene was in, uh, he's in the taxi and uh, it's jet lagged and everything is the, the bright neon sight and so on. That's exactly how I felt when I went there. And I, interestingly, I saw the movie after I went. Huh. And seeing the movie, that was, that was really, I, I couldn't believe how well they captured that, that, that feeling. Mm. And uh, one thing that I found out is Hombu, you get out of it what you bring. Uh, um, yeah, so that's why I'm saying that I can only talk from my perspective. And perhaps some people will relate to my experience, some people will not at all. But uh, that fear I had stepping on the tatami at Hombu has never, ever left me. Mm. Uh, especially when I go back from holiday. I just came back from France. I was... Uh, uh, in Europe uh, for a month and a half uh, teaching Aikido. And then when I went back to Hombu last week for the first time in a while, you know that that that, that tension in your stomach uh, before stepping into the tatami, that was still there. And I think that's crucial. If it's, if it's not there anymore, first you're starting to take things for granted. Yes. And then you risk not progressing anymore. And then if you don't feel that anymore, I think, why, why are you there then? So I am nervous when I go to Hombu. Um, in fact, I get, I often get the fact that people think that I'm a little bit, I will say, uh, uh, austere. Uh, mm. my, I, 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 I don't communicate too much. I don't smile much when I'm at Hombu because I feel that tension. And, uh, that's what I need attention to progress high expectation for myself. Uh, and, uh, to be, uh, you know, that, that sense of danger. Aikido is a very safe practice. I mean, you can, and, in, in, and it's good. It's, it's great that because it, it can touch everybody. So in other words, right. if you want to get that sense of uh, that perception and that uh, zanshin, if you like, and that, that fear that you, people will, will talk about life or death. I mean, that's a bit dramatic. But if you want to get that, that sense, you need to build it yourself in your mind. And there, if you do that, you can get some things out of it. Uh, but that's part of the, the, the personal training, I think. Hmm. Uh, and I uh, you know, until I lose that, that, that pressure when, I, when I'm at Hombu, I'll stay there. There's no reason for me to leave. It means I still have things to learn. Yes. Uh, nice. I think that's, that's part of what we call the beginner's mind, if you like. But I try to keep that beginner's mind for everything. You know, when I go out, I've been in Japan now for about almost 10 years, but I still take my camera with me and I still take pictures because I want to keep that feeling of, my first trip to Japan when everything was new, when I was curious about everything. 
and I was taking in everything and I want to keep that as much as possible. I do not want to be blasé about things. Otherwise, that would be time to move on. I see. That's right. So tell me, what's your regular training schedule like at Humble Dojo? So what's a normal, typical week for you? So, you know, like uh, a lot of people who've been to, do, to, to Humbu, they'll tell you, oh, I trained every day. I did uh, five class, classes per day and so on. Uh, I, can't, I can't claim that. Uh, <laughs> I can't claim that I did five classes per day. At the very beginning, I did a lot of, lot of classes because I had a lot of time and I had a bit of money. Uh, so I didn't have to work straight away. Uh, but, you know, from 6.30 to uh, 8 o'clock at night, uh, no, sometimes... Uh, you know, you go out, you can't get up at 5 a.m. to go to 6.30 class. Uh, sometimes you saw, but I did a lot of classes. Um, so that was very good. And then I started working. So I had to, of course, accommodate a little bit the, the schedule. And uh, I luckily, I finished often early. So I could always make it to the 5.30 class. For So for, for years, I've made the evening classes from 5.30 to, to 8. Uh, I, for a time... Pretty much every day, uh, and then I got married, and, and uh, you know, yeah. uh, other things uh, came into play. So I reduced a little bit the training regime. So uh, that's yeah, that's that's pretty much what it is. So uh, mainly evenings uh, when I when I'm on holiday, I try to do mornings, especially the eight o'clock class because you've got uh, a lot of teachers and and deshi who come to train. So it's a good opportunity to uh, to train with them. In fact, I think the Part of my integration in uh, at Hombu was um, was during that eight o'clock class, when you know, of course, my my Japanese at the time was not very good. It's not, it's still not great, by the way. Um, so communication was sometimes a bit challenging with the shihan with the deshi, and I found that practice really helped uh, mm. establishing that connection and uh, challenging each other and and learning. Of course, when you when you get to practice with a uh, High-ranking Shihan, like uh, like uh, Irie Shihan or Kuribayashi Shihan. I mean, that's you, you, you've got so much to learn. And with the younger deshi uh, and, and instructors, that established a, a more I wouldn't say an even relationship because it's not the hierarchy in Japanese what it is, but certainly uh, that increased an understanding and a mutual respect. I think some with some teachers and uh, and students, uh, sometimes I really didn't have very good relationship at all based on misunderstandings and language barrier and so on. And uh, in many cases, that's evened out with time and with, with good practice. And I, I think that's, that's one of the great things about practice is that, you know, like uh, my, my, my teacher in Daito used to say, uh, words are like uh, makeup. And practice, you don't talk in Japan, you don't speak uh, during the practice at all. So you can't give yourself excuses uh, or, or you can't rationalize things that happened. Uh, you have to handle them as they come. And the next time the person comes to attack you, you have to react again. And I think that's a, that's a very different way of communicating. And that's a very useful one, especially in Japan when the culture and the language are different. Right. And that's, I think, a very important aspect of Hombu is that... Uh, Basically, you don't know who you're going to end up with. Could be a Japanese person, could be a foreigner who's just here for a, a day or two. You have no idea before you come in, and you have to somehow communicate non-verbally with that person. Mm -hmm. It's not always pleasant. Uh, you don't always succeed, uh, but at least, but you have to try. That's one of the things in Hombu. You, you you cannot escape from uh, having to communicate with someone. Uh, which you find in smaller dojos where people know each other well and where they often tend to talk more, that doesn't happen. So Hombu is a great, great training ground for those more than technical aspects uh, because there are good technicians in Aikido everywhere in the world. And if you want to find a good dojo, it's, it's not hard. But the non-technical and the non-verbal aspects, I think, are, are quite uh, specific to, uh, to Hombu, perhaps. Hmm. And at Hombu, when you... Uh, when you're in a class and you pair with somebody, you, you pair with that person for the whole class or for a good portion of the class, is that right? Yes, I mean, that used to be uh, the case much more so than right now. Uh, that, that tends to change a little bit. But yes, uh, you, in, in general, you would pair up with the same person for an hour. For example, in, in Doshu's class, yes. you will be with the same person for an hour. Uh, so you've got two uh, solutions. You either pick the person ahead of time <laughs> uh, just to make sure that you don't, you know, uh, 
using brackets, you know, waste your hour, or you can go with whoever you, uh, whoever happens to be sitting next to you. Uh, me, because I have, you know, I am very shy person, so I would never go and ask someone to train with me. I can't do that. Uh, so I just end up with whoever uh, near me, and I find that that's a, that's a good thing. It's sometimes it's a very 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 long hour, uh, either because the person is so much better than you that they they just uh, you know destroy you, <laughs> uh, or somehow you can't communicate. But that's all part of the um, of the training. I mean, Aikido is easy. The techniques are not hard to master uh, if you pay attention and if you you know have a pretty decent command of your own body. So where is the challenge? Well, you, you know, you, there is no match, no competition, so you never lose. You always win in Aikido. And uh, so the only source of difficulty and frustration is that relationship with others. Mm. So if you somehow refuse to challenge yourself like that, I think you're missing a great deal of what Aikido has to bring. Uh, so in other words, I n try not to train with friends, but I always pick the meanest looking uh, guy or the, the 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 person i would really not to talk to or i try to pick the the smallest possible uh, person in the dojo me being like um, you know over one meter 80 so that it's very hard to train uh, so to go in the difficulty not to go through the easy uh, route and i think you owe this to yourself if you want to progress otherwise you know how long can you do uh, Kote Gaishi until you you know you, you get it right I think personally if you've been instructed properly it doesn't take so long yes yeah yeah certainly diminishing returns to just focus on right on the the, the technical basics again and again and again again and not not be aware of the other layers of the of the mm. training and the in the personal yeah, development yeah. so um, a little bit more on Hombu Dojo for for somebody that's coming to visit let's say um, what what can they expect to to learn there? What kind of benefit should they be should they be seeking to get the most out of it? Well, um, as a visitor, I think yeah, I think you've got to separate the technical aspect and the uh, how do you say cultural aspect. Um, technically, Hombu Dojo, you've got like I think on the official list there are thirty instructors, so that's a lot of people, yep. and even though people tend to think that practice is becoming more uniform, um, if you really look into it, you will find very, very different ways to do things. I mean, I think the, the core ideas and principles, whatever you put behind that, those terms, are, are, are the same. But the expression is, is different. I mean, there is no denying that if you... Uh, go to Yokota Sensei's class and then you move on to uh, uh, Miyamoto Sensei's class, uh, I mean, they're obviously not doing the same uh, thing, at, at least, uh, you know, uh, on the outside form. So there is that, um, that great diversity. So one of the first things that you will have to deal with is that diversity, uh, which I think is really good. I mean, there, I can't think of many, many places in the world have that many teachers and that different approaches. Hmm. That's kind of interesting um, because, you know, sort of one of the um, common perhaps misconceptions is that the, you know, the, the technique at the, at the Aikikai at Hambu Dojo, it's very uniform and very kind of plain vanilla. But from what I'm hearing from you is there are vastly different technical approaches between the instructors. Well, I think so. I think, I mean, whether that's less the case now than before, uh, that's up to debate. But probably, probably, let's be honest. Um, but still, there is that diversity. And then at the end of the day, you know, if you make me listen to uh, rap music, I'm going to feel that everything's the same. Uh, but somebody who's well into it and who knows it and who's been listening to it for a long time, they'll point out the differences to you. And they might be fundamental, massive differences. I think it's a matter of uh, really looking at it carefully enough so that you can actually perceive the differences. Um, and, and they are there. Um, so that at least certainly I can see them. So hmm. I know that, for example, to the point that there are some classes where I don't really go because there are some practices that I don't really enjoy as much as others. Sure. And because I, I can't train every single class, I prioritize. Uh, and so, you know, I wouldn't be doing that if the practice was the same everywhere. 
And um, what's your perspective? You trained at Hanbu Dojo, but you have a really good view of of the global Aikido world, I think, uh, just through kind of the, you know, the interviews and the research and the, and the media work and the travel that you do. And, um, you know, what do you think is, is really the, the role of Hambu Dojo in today's Aikido world? Um, I think that that brings us, I think, to the, to a great extent, to the cultural aspect of things. Aikido has been in, uh, in the, in the West or in the rest of the world for a long time. I mean, if you think about the U S if you think about, uh, Europe, since the since the 50s uh so that's been a long time we've got very very advanced teachers uh so technically speaking i think uh yeah the, the if you go to good dojos the level is not uh better at hombu than uh, in other excellent dojos mm-hmm. uh, but i think hombu plays a role for the cultural aspect of things as i told you i came from a group which was not really uh, tied to hombu in, in any way so it's what I would coin uh, a very French way to do Aikido. Uh, the standards of French, the, the, the way to look at things of French. And that, it's not a bad thing necessarily, but uh, I think it's a shame not to take in the cultural aspects of, of Aikido as well. So Hombu, I think, has um, plays a role uh, in that. Uh, it links practitioners together first uh, within the same training place. When people go to Hombu, they come from every single country. There are not that many places in the world where that happens. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's very relevant. And also they connect practitioners with the history and the culture of the, of the discipline. So, um, you know, just the sheer fact of being instructed in Japanese uh, when teachers talk at all, which some barely do, uh, and have to deal with some of the etiquette uh, is important. And again, having to deal with a Japanese person is a little bit different, of course, than dealing with somebody from your country. So often you're going to have to go through Aikido to communicate with that person. So I think that's very important. And I like the idea, and I think that's what uh, the current Doshu is doing, of gathering everybody under the same umbrella. Um, not necessarily to uniformize the technique, because that's something that often comes up that uh, somehow Hombu would want to uh, make the practice more uniform. I do not know about the intentions. I can only see the evidence I have. And uh, I have never seen or heard anything coming from Hombu trying to uniformize some, some practice. In fact, to be honest, I'm seeing people do stuff and I'm like, how on earth do they get away with doing that? And, and, and uh, <laughs> still, you know, being able to promote people and so on. Now, of course, that's my judgment and it's worth what it's worth, yeah, i.e. nothing. Uh, but I, I don't see really a, a, an in, a, a system in place to uniformize the technique. So I think it's a matter of gathering people and they're one organization. And the fact that this organization happens to be the one which is run by the Ueshiba family is, is nice. doesn't have to be. Uh, but the fact that it is, is, is uh, an added bonus. Uh, and, you know, then people do what they want to do. I mean, uh, except from sending a couple of Shihan to teach seminars, uh, I, I, I don't really see, and, you know, people can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, I don't really see Hombu uh, issuing sets of instructions as to how you should be doing that technique now that you've been registered at the Aikikai. I don't think that happens. No, I, And in I, fact, I, you see... Uh, a lot of people who uh, who have left the Aikikai a uh, long time ago, uh, they tend to go back within the Aikikai. So the reason behind that, I don't know. The reason behind the Aikikai to uh, welcome them back, I don't know. But it happens. And I think it's a good thing because the more we mix, the more we train together, in spite of our diverging practices, the better it is for everybody. So I'm very happy when I see people with different practices coming back to the Aikikai and I think it brings new blood and that way we can keep all improving and the, and the art stays relevant. I would hate uh, for the opposite to happen, uh, to have one single way to do things. There are things that I don't like, there are things that I like, but at least they are all here and uh, there's that richness. And I think the, the Aikikai has meaning for that. 
the grades, the hierarchical grades, is a completely different discussion, which I'm happy to discuss uh, on the side, but that's a completely different thing. But as a sense of identity and, uh, and like a big extended family, which is sometimes dysfunctional, sometimes people you don't like, mm -hmm. the old uncle that you hate, <laughs> uh, but we're all family. Uh, and I think that's important. It was um, it was explained to me quite well uh, by uh, Miyamoto Shihan when I first uh, first arrived. We we were having a dinner one night, and I, and I one one day I talked to him and I said, okay, look, I, I don't I don't understand why you're taking Azuke, that person who is uh, making a lot of trouble at Hombu, and uh, by taking her Azuke, you're kind of uh, uh, making her a little bit more legitimate and in a way, perhaps encouraging her to in her behavior. And he said to me, you don't understand. Uh, you don't pick uh, your family. Uh, Aikido is a family. And as long as people want to come at home, they're part of the family, whether you like them or not. And what we can do as family members is to try to help each other, uh, you know, uh, become better. So in other words, he was taking her on not to make her feel good about herself, but to try to keep her in the fold and hopefully with time to make her realize that she would have to uh, behave a bit better. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that when I heard that, I thought, okay, no, that's, that's, that's great. That's one of the things I think that's, is worth hearing and, and Hombu perhaps is a good place for that. Wow. So yeah, let's talk about grading a little bit since you, since you mentioned mm -hmm. it. My, my definition of a, of a grade uh, is, the, is the same uh, as that uh, which was formulated by, by Tadashi, and I can't quote the source because I forgot where it came from, but it's uh, a grade uh, signifies, represents a relationship between a teacher and a student. And if you call that an Aikikai grade, it's a grade within the framework of that big Aikikai family. But it has very little meaning except for that relationship, which is why even a grade given by the same teacher to different people, even the same grade, the same level, you can't compare them horizontally. They are only valid vertically, in my opinion. They represent that relationship. There is a lot technically that happens, but not only. It can be a, a personal relationship or the grade can sanction your involvement within the organization. It can sanction the amount of effort because for some reason, I don't know, you, you have a handicap. You obviously you can't do the technique exactly as it's shown uh, in, the, in, the, in the books or whatever. But you try hard and, and you deserve that grade just as much as people who are uh, like a virtuoso of techniques. So there are multiple criteria. They are not all explicit. A lot of them are implicit. A lot of them are cultural. Uh, but it's a very important thing. So the question you need to ask is, who gave you your grade? Uh, and it's up to you also to work out why. Uh, but it's completely meaningless to compare yourself to others, which is why when you think, and, and I think that sometimes, oh, how come I'm, 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 I'm a fifth dan and how come that person is fifth dan? I mean, look at what they're doing. It's, they're not up to the level. But then I have to take a step back and say, wait, hang, hang on a second. Who am I to actually judge uh, that person and the person who gave them that grade? There must be very good reasons and uh, and that grade represents that relationship of that person with that particular teacher. And that's it. And uh, that way you avoid that, what I was referring to as the, the, the hidden competition between people. So I value grades for what they are. Uh, they are milestones on a, on a progression and they signify a relationship. It's very important for me who gave me my grades and, and, and where uh, where I got them from. But it's only valuable for me. Uh, otherwise, that piece of paper has no value at all. Uh, it's certainly not something you should brag about. <laughs> right. Um, but it's, I mean, if you brag about it, it means that you don't understand the meaning of the paper you receive. It's a bit of a shame. But OK, you have time. You, 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 you might actually change uh, with time. That's why there are so many of them. Uh, but grades are very dangerous. Uh, and that's one of the difficulties of Aikido, because grades are all what we have. We don't have rankings and championships and so on. So yes. even if you get a little bit full of yourself because you just got promoted, if the next week uh, you get beaten up by uh, by somebody in competition, that evens out a little bit the the the, the, the whole uh, the whole field. In Aikido, we don't have that. So oh, now I'm I'm a godan now. Oh, so I'm gonna teach everybody who's not a godan, obviously, and uh, and my techniques have to work on everybody who's not a godan. Uh, so first, of course, that doesn't happen. 
uh, that's not healthy and also that's a little bit unrealistic uh, expectation to be having for myself i have to allow myself to uh, to fail my techniques and sometimes on people who are even q grades and that's yes. all right uh, you can have high expectations for your practice and uh, in terms of principles in terms of not cheating in, ter in terms of not giving yourself excuses but you also need to give yourself room for uh, for progression and uh, and not to have unrealistic uh, expectations and so it's not because you wear hakama it's not because you're yondan godan rokudan that you should be uh, you should not uh, make mistake or you should not fail failing is part of the learning process nobody expects uh, footballers in the world cup to get every single uh, ball in the in the goal right yeah that's so why for sure. is it in aikido that we expect the teachers to never make a mistake never get hit uh, for me it's actually dubious when a teacher never makes mistakes and never never gets hit because I can't help thinking that somehow they must be fudging the game so that it's at their advantage. Otherwise, if really they were working on the edge, they would make mistakes. Yes. And what I see in, in, in Japan, in Hombu, teachers make mistakes uh, because they push themselves. Miyamoto Sensei uh, sometimes uh, stumbles, Osawa Sensei. Why? Because, and that's why I respect them so much, even though they're Shihan, Seventh Dan or Eighth Dan, they are still practicing and they're still learning. And that, that's, I think that's one thing with Hombu. Uh, those guys are in such a rigid structure, hierarchically. And Doshu is at the top, and and, and there is that, that whole Senpai Kohai thing. Uh, they're not at the top of the pyramid. And that way, they're all practitioners. They happen to be just more uh, advanced than you, uh, uh, older than you, really, in other words. Uh, and I think that's good. That's, that's very healthy. Yes. I totally agree. And I, I see similar stuff out, out here in the States. I mean, I've seen Seventh Dons doing demonstrations in a seminar and the, the uke will attack, you know, very sincerely, very hard. And, you know, guys will get clipped, uh, you know, Seventh Don, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll get hit or, you know, technique won't work or whatever. And I think that's, that's great because it, you know, it's, um, it shows that they are, they are pushing themselves and that, um, you know, when it works, it, it works. Right. And when it doesn't work, you, you know, you, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's all right. I mean, it's not yeah. magic, right? right? It's not uh, it's not infallible. So uh, and, and nobody is. So, you know, chill out and, you know, train with your with your heart. Train honestly. Don't give yourself excuses. And then, the, you know, if you fail, that's OK. Uh, yeah. And that that includes teaching. That includes teaching, as you said. Um, I mean, students seeing a teacher make a mistake we we'll learn just as much, perhaps even more, uh, about the techniques than uh, than seeing always the same technique being performed perfectly. Otherwise, they just have to buy the DVD, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I agree. So maybe we can segue a little bit and talk um, mm -hmm. just a little bit about the idea of um, Budo in, in Japanese mm -hmm. culture. And um, yeah. because this is something where I think Sometimes Westerners have a maybe a slightly different view of you know of Budo and the the intent and the philosophy behind it um, than you know than than you'll find in Japan. And as a Westerner mm. in Japan, I'm you know I think you might be a good person to to chat about this for a bit. Okay, um, I think yes, um, Budo is a term that everybody knows about, but I feel that the some element of it which are perhaps a little bit misunderstood. Um, and uh, I mean, my opinion is very much based on that of the, the researchers, the prominent researchers on the topic. Uh, is that, and especially in Japan, it's, it's way more obvious in Japan. Um, it's uh, what they call uh, Ningen Keise no Michi, which is the, the way of uh, human perfection, human development. Um, and in Japan, it's obvious. It's uh, people do Aikido or Budo to become better human beings. The motivation of doing Budo for self-defense purposes is, uh, is very, very, very minor compared to that in Japan. So, of course, being in Japan, I, I would take that for granted. So I probably need to a little bit uh, uh, justify that, uh, that, uh, that claim, right? It's, it's, in Japan, it's all about practice. It has to do with the way they learn as well. In, in, in the West, we want to understand something before we can do it well. In Japan, they need to do it well before they, uh, they understand it. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, so it's practice, practice, practice. Some people tend to think that it's brainless practice, that they don't really think much. And perhaps they, perhaps Japanese read a little bit less, the average Japanese reads less about Aikido and so on than, than Westerners, I don't know, perhaps. Uh, but they feel that it's through the, the grind of, of, of practice that they will understand it little by little, they will become better. And uh, I relate to that in the sense that I think I su successfully uh, integrated in Japan because somehow I did the same. I never questioned things in Japan. I never tried to understand straight away. I just, okay, I, I'm, I'm told that I have to do this. Okay, I don't get it. I think it's a, sometimes a little bit stupid. That's fine, I'll do it. Uh, it's not my country, uh, it's not my culture. I, uh, I want to live here, so if I want to live here, I've got to adapt to that culture and to do it the way they want. And I find that very, very often, given enough time, I will figure it out later. And it makes perfect sense once I figure it out. It's, it becomes obvious. Ah, oh, yes, of course. And to the point that, uh, what else could you do? It's, it's so meaningful to do it that way. How come I, I thought that it was meaningless before? And uh, I think that's the, the, probably the Japanese think a little bit that way. And um, so it's, it's, it's the grind of practice for practice sake and for becoming better. They, they don't try to rationalize it as much as we do, I think. And because Japan is such a safe country, uh, I think the, uh, the fear of having to defend oneself is, is, uh, is, is very, very, uh, a very minor consideration. Yes. It's a much, much lower priority. Like, you know, Yes. Right, right. So, it's, I mean, of course, I will never judge somebody who goes into martial arts to defend themselves because they've had bad experiences because they live in, in, in places of the world which are not as lucky uh, as Japan. Of course, it's not. And I, I don't want people to think that I'm judgmental of those people and, or that I feel that those motivations are, are beneath me, but I'm just not in that situation. But I would say, however, that Budo were not intended for self-defense. And I claim that, and I have evidence for this, and I'm, of course, I'm not the only one to claim it. Uh, and uh, research shows that it's not, it was not meant for this. Um, I mean, if you just look at the techniques which are practiced, they, I mean, uh, the people who are really into self-defense and so on are very critical of what they call traditional arts, and I think for good reason, technically speaking. Uh, so, you know, Budo were created as, a, as educational systems uh, not necessarily for very good reason, by the way, because it was mostly to try to get the Japanese population to, uh, into the, the war efforts during the Second World War. And one of the way to, to get that sort of sense of nationalism and to get that, that group dynamic, you know, Budo was a great thing to do because that, that played on the sense of pride of the Japanese and their, their sense of, of, uh, of uh, special culture and so on. So Kendo and Judo and so on were used for those purposes. And not at all for teaching uh, martial techniques, but as a sort of brainwashing sort of uh, system. And um, that, that's the, the, when we talk about Budo, uh, um, starting from the Second World War, that's very much what happens, and perhaps even, uh, perhaps even better, uh, even, even before. Uh, so those are the control system, and the, the techniques have been modified uh, across the board to be uh, safer, because they had to be taught in schools. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you can't go and break people uh, or stab people and so on. So if you're going to start modifying your techniques to make them safer so they can be taught in schools, you're no longer technique, uh, uh, teaching a, a self-defense technique, are you? Uh, and some researchers, such as uh, Carl Friday, actually argue that uh, the traditional uh, martial techniques, the Koryu, the old schools, Actually, we are no more uh, inclined to being used on battlefield than uh, than, than than Budo. So mm -hmm. Carl Friday, uh, he took as evidence the, the remains of, uh, of of people die, who died in battles, and he found that, for example, the sword was barely used in battle at all. People who die from uh, uh, you know being hit by stones or, or stabbed with spears uh, or, or arrows or even gunfire later on. And, but uh, sword wounds were very minor, especially uh, lethal uh, sword wounds. So if you, if, you, if you think about the fact that the sword is so central uh, within the technical curriculum of many, many old schools of martial arts, and how little it seems to have been used on the, on the battlefield, you've got something to explain here. Uh, 
Right. Well, I mean, uh, the call you were probably educational system or, or social uh, gatherings uh, where they studied very, very refined techniques, uh, but outside certainly of the framework of, of, uh, of the battlefield. And especially since a lot of the, not all, but a lot of the schools were actually founded after the, the start of the Tokugawa shogunate, when basically uh, most uh, large-scale wars were, 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 were over. And those schools, of course, were small. They, they wouldn't teach as many people uh, as they were fighters, right? So those guys on the ground would have been taught very, very differently, very different things. So even the arts that um, our ancestors of our own uh, are prob were probably not really meant to be used as is on the battlefield. There was more of a, of a, of a long-term ideal behind that and, and social considerations. So we're just the product of that. And if you look into history, then you realize that. And in my view, you start seeing in Budo some uh, benefits or some purposes which go beyond just uh, just fighting. And that's, that's quite interesting. And in addition to kind of the, the general concept of, of Budo uh, as, as something that perhaps has a different perception in, in Japan and outside of Japan, um, I think there's also kind of a similar difference in perspective on the idea of uh, Aikido's philosophy of harmony, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe you can talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the, that's the cultural and linguistic aspect of it as well. Um, so, can do you need to speak Japanese or to know about Japanese culture? to do a good kote gaishi, even like a so-called efficient kote gaishi. Uh, no, I don't think you do. But if you want to understand the motivation of the founder, the reason for the art to exist and what's behind, I think it's important. And um, as you said, harmony, it is such a kind of worms um, because we are using our own uh, Judeo-Christian uh, perception of what harmony is. Um, harmony in Japan, this is the kanji wa. We, call, we talk uh, about uh, wa no budo. But the actual meaning of wa, uh, okay, it translates as harmony, but not in a, in a sort of a, a tree hugging way. Harmony is uh, in, in, in Japanese, and that, that's my understanding. So, uh, you know, take it also with a pinch of salt. But for me, this is the, um, how would you say, uh, it's the, it's within a group, it's whether is the fact of accepting a set of social rules within a group so that relationships can be can flow can be simple. Uh, so you don't have, in other words, you don't have to like people. You don't even have to be a particularly good person. But if you and I accept the same set of rule, the same sort of sort of um, idiosyncrasies, if you like, we're going to get on just fine. Okay, we're going to be in harmony, and I think to a great extent that's the way uh, Japanese think about wa, think about harmony. So wa no budo, this is a way of having, in my view, of having a common practice, a set of techniques, a certain terminology, uh, some uh, so, so some habits like wearing a keikogi and so on, training at the same place in a dojo so that we can actually get on together and you can get on with people with whom you might not have communicated without that. But I don't think it goes much further than that, certainly not in, sort, in the sort of uh, harmony in the, in the Western sense. And I think what uh, the Japanese and, and probably the founder of Aikido had in mind with the, the Wa no Budo is that, which is why it's very easy to uh, get that sense of harmony within a very, very, um, how would you say, nationalistic expansionist uh, policy because it's like you know it's like the romans uh, you know you, you could get on very well with the romans even if they invaded the country as long as you became a roman but it's the same with the japanese okay let's the japanese like let's let us all be in harmony the japanese way and then i'm going to beat you over the head to make you understand that and once you've understood that we'll be in harmony <laughs> right so it's it's less about a kind of peace and harmony and it's more about social order yes right and and it is important i mean of course the the whole i mean that's the, it's one of the things that 
was used to justify the war effort in, uh, during the Second World War. But on a day-to-day -day basis in Japan, it is very, very uh, pleasant to live here. Why? Because everybody follows the same set of rules. And that's why transports, even though the number of people is huge, most people know where to go, know how to behave, know what to do. They know that they don't, they should not be talking in the train because some people want to sleep. There are a whole set of social rules which makes life in Japan, once you understand those rules, very comfortable, very easy. Now, some people may think it's very uh, uniform and you sense your, you lose your sense of identity. And what if I really want to talk loud in the train? Yes, you can, of course. But the, you know, the day you really want to sleep in the train because you're tired going to work, uh, you'd appreciate people not talking loud in the train. So th that's the Japanese harmony, if you like. Right, right. And it only takes, and then you can't think that, of course, absolutely everybody behaves like that. But as long as there are enough people who behave like this, the whole system works. The system breaks when those common set of rules are no longer uh, followed. And yeah. that is, in my view, Japanese harmony. But it takes time. It takes attention. You're not expected to know all the rules when you come to Japan, but you need to pay attention to what's going on. And in Hombu, it's the same. Very few people will criticize you at Hombu for not doing the right thing. Some old people will get mad at you, but that's actually quite rare. But if you don't know what to do, just like look at what everybody does, do the same, and don't do what, some, what nobody else do. Uh, lining up, you know, if everybody is on the same side of the room, go there. Right. Don't think, oh, there's nobody there. Oh, there's space. So I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to go there. <laughs> no, you don't know. It's not obvious to you, but there may be a very good reason why you don't go there. And observation and paying attention and following basic rules, that is, in other words, harmony. Right, right. And I, I, I certainly think that the awareness and observation and, and respect, that's something that regardless of the culture you're in, that those are, those are valuable attributes to, to absolutely, have. Absolutely, absolutely. Sure. And, yeah. you know, and again, this I mean, kind I've, of... I've been, sorry. I, yeah, I was just going to say, in terms of, of this interpretation of, of harmony, I, I don't necessarily think that, you know, di different interpretations are, are bad or wrong, but I think it's just, it's good mm -hmm. to be able to kind of understand the, you know, the context and how within different cultures this is, this is viewed differently. Yeah, I, I, actually, that's a very good point because I don't want to undermine uh, the value uh, behind what the Western civilization has brought. I think this is great. We have democracy. We've got, uh, you know, uh, as, as, as good as a gender equality as we, uh, as we have at the moment. It can be better, of course, but we, we're working towards that. Uh, so, of course, I don't want to sound as somebody who says, oh, we all have to become Japanese and do like the Japanese because there are a lot of things that we do better than the Japanese. But as you said, you go to Japan, you follow their rules. When I was in Ireland, I tried to not become Irish, but to follow the, the way the Irish did things. When I was in England, it's the same. Yes. And having been uh, an, uh, an immigrant for a long time, um, I think I had that maturity in me uh, to, to do that. Uh, you don't negate your own identity, but uh, you know things work a certain way. Uh, and you just have to, to 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 do it that way if you want things to go well. Right, right. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about your Daito Ryu practice. And uh, mm -hmm. you're, you hold the rank of third dan, I think, in Daito Ryu. And I, how long have you been training? Um, it's this year is the tenth year. Uh, I started on my very very first trip to Japan. I got very lucky. Um, somebody called Olivier Gorin, who's a, who's a French uh, person who's been living in Japan for a very, very long time. Uh, I knew him from his books and we'd been in contact through emails. And uh, when I came to Japan, uh, you know, he said, oh, let's meet, let's train. And he was already doing Daito Ryu and there was a seminar right at that time. And he said, oh, why don't you join? And I had heard about Daito Ryu. I thought, okay, why not? You know, uh, uh, it could be a good experience. So I went there. Uh, and so I'm very happy he shared that with me. Seminar was like three or four hours. Uh, I did not enjoy it very much, I must admit, uh, because the practice is quite different. We're more static, a lot more details. Uh, the, uh, and I wanted to, at that time, you know, because I was younger, I really wanted to move, to work out, to slow people, to be thrown, but that, that didn't happen like this. Mm. But I left and I thought that was, mm, that was interesting. I'm glad I did it. At least I've, I've experienced that once in my life. 
But then when I came back to Japan a few months later to actually settle that time, Olivier came back to me and he said, okay, uh, now you're going to join Daitoryu, right? And I said, well, no, no, why? Uh, I, I do Aikido at Hongbu, I'm happy. Uh, and, he, and he made me realize that, he, you know, that, that cultural item was available to me, it was given to me. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be a fool not to, uh, to actually uh, accept it, right? So I registered. I went to the seminars. I, to be honest, for the first two or three years, I hated it. He had to call me the night before to make sure I would turn up because if I could skip, I would do it because the wrists, uh, the wrists were uh, were sore. And uh, the UK me is quite different because in Daito you you're not so much uh, thrown as you are. You're, 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 you're fell down, in other words. So because you fall, you don't, there's not so much control in your own ukemi, so it's a bit more awkward. Yes. And because the practice is, is less intense than in Aikido, you don't get the adrenaline pumping, so the little hits uh, are, are more painful. And, and uh, So I, I didn't enjoy it at all, but I, um, I'm grateful to Olivier for having you know, really, really uh, pushed me to continue. Because after a while, after a few years, I realized that it had become me, it become part of me, that the, the, the Aikido principles and techniques were inside me now. And I, I built that sense of identity. And, and then from that point, practice started to make sense. I made connections and I started to enjoy myself. Practice became part of me, um, not that I was any good at it, but I could say I'm a Dr. You practitioner. Uh, I felt I was not lying by saying that I, I, I started to, to, to integrate some things uh, and started to enjoy it as well now just as much as, uh, as Aikido and um, I started to find bridges as well between Aikido and Daitoryu before it was very hard I always put them in opposition and in, to some extent some Daitoryu teachers often explain to me things in opposition to Aikido not to criticize Aikido necessarily, but to, to put it in a, in a way that I could understand it, you see. And then little by little, the frustration went away and I could see the connections. And I became proud of being an Aikidoka and a Daitoryu practitioner in both settings. It's not that I was doing Aikido in Daitoryu or Daitoryu in Aikido, but I knew that doing both helped my general understanding um, of both. Mm. Uh, still being very respectful of both systems. Uh, um, but at the end of the day, uh, what happens inside is the same thing. Uh, the training, it's, I think the difference between dietary and Aikido are basically training methodologies. Um, the, the, the curriculum in dietary is way, way more extensive. It's been really uh, shrunk down in Aikido for good reason. Uh, mainly because if you really want to spread something, you can't have 3,000 techniques. Uh, you're going to need to teach some teachers who in turn are going to teach others. Uh, so, of course, you need to s simplify to some extent, but not, not in the negative sense, to simplify it so that you can communicate the most important aspect to the largest possible number. Yes. Uh, whereas in I told you, the curriculum is extremely extensive for very, very few people ever actually uh, learn, uh, I wouldn't even say everything, but a substantial amount, it's so huge. Hmm. So what do you want to do? Uh, do you want to keep it unchanged, as extensive as possible, running the risk that it's going to disappear, which in Daito you could way, very well have, or you want to simplify it so that at least prioritize and get the main aspects across and, and make it thrive, which is what Aikido did. And to some extent, Daito you survived Thanks to Aikido, because Aikido practitioners took an interest in Daito Ryu, went to practice. People like Stan took an historical interest and started talking about Daito Ryu. Yep. Of course, I would never have heard about Daito Ryu if it wasn't for, for Stan and Pranin. Yeah. Um, so I, Daito Ryu owes a lot to Aikido and to Stan. Yes. <laughs> uh, or that they wouldn't have survived. There are so many old schools uh, in, in Japan which have disappeared because for some reason, you know, the, usually the, all the techniques, the entirety of the, the school's knowledge are only passed on to one or two people, two, just in case one dies. So, you know, with time, you know, when something happens, sometimes schools disappear. They, they, they're getting so secretive and so on that they, they all but disappear. 
and uh, they change as well. I mean, they are not carved in stone, and uh, you know, Ellis uh, is um, gives a very uh, convincing uh, uh, argument about this that Koryu have always been changing. But if you don't want to change, or if you don't want to make an effort to teach it, then it's going to it's going to disappear. And uh, a lot of uh, the material I was uh, you know I was writing that that article for Soden uh, for Aikido Journal a few weeks ago, and that certainly was happening with the Soden techniques. Is that fewer and fewer people actually uh, remember how to do them, uh, and mm. that that's an issue. Can can it be helped? I'm not quite sure, because of course it's always the between spreading thin. <laughs> or keeping intact but not spreading at all, uh, both have issues. Yes. Uh, which is which is why I think it's very relevant for me. I, I, I don't I don't try to convince people to do diet or not what I'm doing, but for me, it's very really relevant to do both. I do both because I can. I'm in a situation where I have teachers available, and uh, because I've got that time and interest as well. So what are some of the key insights that you've, you know, you've gained from your Daito Ryu practice in, in the context of um, understanding uh, your Aikido? Yeah, well, I think the main thing, I started Daito Ryu at the back of my mind. I said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start Daito Ryu. I'm going to learn once and for all how to do Kote Gaishi properly and that bit. And then I'll do it that way and nobody can criticize my Kote Gaishi anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, what I found out very quickly is that there were many ways to do Kotegashi in Daitoryu, and even between schools of Daitoryu, there are different ways as well to do. So at first, I was extremely disappointed. I thought, <laughs> no, 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 no. I wanted simple answers. I wanted the truth. And I found out that there are many truths, and I hate that. I'm a scientist, you see. Uh, that doesn't sit well with me. However, I found out later that there were reasons why there were several ways to do it. A particular techniques because they don't the internal principles behind the internal mechanics is a better word than principles actually uh, behind can be different the, so even if the name of the technique is the same or the general idea of how do you, you twist that, that that limb is the same the the motor can be different so of course you get a finer understanding of how the body works and the the, the mechanics behind the motions but actually even more importantly and that's why i talk about diet or you is that it justifies the fact that in Aikido people do things in different ways. It is so easy to reject something that you've not seen before as wrong or fake or whatever, mm -hmm. or non-existent, but an absence of evidence is not an evidence of absence. It's not because you've never seen that Aikido done in your school that it is wrong to do it that way. All it shows is the extent of your ignorance. All it says is that you have not been taught that Kote Gaishi, assuming that the Kote Gaishi comes from a legitimate source, okay? But often we are very judgmental, or oh, they do Swariwaza all in Seiza or all in Kisa, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. But basically, they're both wrong because they are very uh, precise steps where you should be in Seiza and Kisa and Swariwaza and so on. Or that Kote Gaishi is wrong, ours is better. No, if you assuming that you come from legitimate lines, they actually are both valid, they, 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 they use different principles. So once you, once you start understanding that, you're far less judgmental of people, which is actually a good thing because I can't talk for everybody, but certainly in the school where I started, I heard that constantly. TCA was not doing Aikido. Uh, the Japanese didn't know how to do Aikido anymore. Uh, that school across the street, they had no idea how to do Kotegashi, only ours was right. And I heard that, and especially when I was young and I, and I actually mimicked that, uh, that uh, that way of speaking for, for a long time. But as I traveled, I started to meet more and more people who have different ways to do. And all of them actually, oh, you, you were, I was lucky every single time because I always hit the dojo who had the truth. You know, you, you, you're lucky you start in the dojo who, who's got it right, like when everybody else doesn't. So no, it can't be true. All those claims are mutually exclusive. So it can't be like that. And I told you provided me actually evidence to, to justify that. And, uh, and I find myself way more tolerant uh, towards other practices. Now I'm doing diet or you. Whether that's something I want to do myself, not necessarily, but I can understand where it comes from. Hmm. And uh, it's the image of the tree, right? My, my diet or you teacher who passed away last year um, used to say that diet or you or Aikido or Budo or, or Aiki arts, if you want, are like a tree. There's a trunk and then branches go in all different directions. 
as long as you're clear what's your line, and that's where certificates and ranks come into play, who is your teacher and who was your teacher's teacher and how far back can you go? And then branches can go in every sort of direction. And as long as they are truthful about their history, their line, the branch gets stronger and in turn the trunk gets stronger. What I happened to do, I started in a branch and then I started to not jump from branch to branch, but I went back to the trunk and I started to make my way down to other branch from that trunk. And that's where I could understand things better. Right. Um, so there is no, I mean, better school than others. They all, they, look, they've all made their own choices of practice for uh, pedagogical uh, reasons or for the reason that the teacher happened to do that technique better than the others. Uh, uh, so he's chosen that one or that way to do. And it's perfectly fine. It's legitimate as long as you're not lying about what you're doing. Right. And, and I personally got, uh, you could say, a similar outlook or perspective, but from a totally different source, um, who's um, Dan Innocento. And he was... Um, mm -hmm. He was Bruce Lee's best friend and, and collaborator right. and, and student and teacher. And um, it, he's seen, I mean, so many martial arts. He's, he's, uh, right. Somebody said to me once, oh, he's, he's already forgotten more about martial arts than, than you'll ever learn in your lifetime. <laughs> and, um, you know, his, his take is sort of like, okay, there are so many different ways of doing a given technique. And um, one way might integrate better with a certain school's movement system. And it's, it's mm -hmm. instead of looking at something and saying, well, this is right or this is wrong, it's much better to look at, at a given thing and, and start saying, okay, well, well, what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing it this way, right? And how might this integrate better with, with this movement system? And, and what's the, the context for this? And, and where did it come from? As opposed to just simply dismissing something as, oh, this is wrong. It's, you know... It's not, not uh, absolutely. Not I mean, way. I mean, the, 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 the point is context. You've said it. It is so important. Context is where do your technique come from? Why were they done that way? What is the context, historical, cultural, social, what have you? And I think missing that context uh, is, a, is a bit of a shame because you miss a lot of, uh, of, of clues to understand what you're doing. And why, for example, when you're in Hamdan that she was a uh, in Daito you do you do one technique if somebody grabs you on the right hand or you do another technique if somebody grabs you on the left hand it's not that you couldn't do one or the other it's just that there's a good reason uh, context wise why you're kneeling down where's your sword and so on for doing one or the other mm -hmm. and, uh, that, and that, that brings answers to questions and what I find when I when I teach and that that's the that's the thing that I like is that People come to talk to me and they say, okay, uh, well, perhaps your practice is not what I would really want to do all year long. But at least when we get answers, they make sense. They don't like, they don't sound phony. Why? Because I don't make them up. Right. I've been told that way. I've been uh, I've told this is historically what happens. It doesn't negate other things, but at least the answer makes sense. And it's not often, it's, it's again the same thing. It's okay to say you don't know as a teacher. It's okay to fail. A student comes and asks you the question, well, look, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why, why, why this is the case. Go and find out. There are other people who know. It's not because I don't know that other people don't know. The knowledge is there. Nobody's been, nothing's been lost. Just, you know, uh, pack your bag and go find out. Yeah, yep. I, I get that question, or, or I, I have that situation um, happen quite often where I'll get asked a question and I don't know the answer. And fortunately, I you know, I have a lot of, people and resources I can draw on and do some homework and mm -hmm. sometimes I can find the answer and, and come back but I have no problem saying hey I I don't know <laughs> yeah it's okay it's yeah. okay I mean uh, let's take for example uh, I often take that example so Ariwaza, right yes so Ariwaza, when I learned Aikido I was taught oh this is to develop your hips and if you move well in so Ariwaza, you're going to move awesomely well when you're standing that's why we do so Ariwaza, is to get your motion right now historically this is not right uh, in Daitoryu, you start in, in Suariwaza, it's called Idori in mm -hmm. my school. Uh, and Suaru, this is to sit, right? It doesn't mean, it's not like Shiko Waza, it's not like uh, doing Shiko, you know, when you're on your knees walking on the tatami, that's not that. They actually sit you down when you start Daitoryu for a long time, for a few months, so that you can actually remove a number of variables in your body equation and focus on the upper part of your body 
on your hands especially. I see. Uh, that's where you start in Suwaliwaza. You just remove a number of variables so that you can simplify it and understand what's going on on the on the tewaza, on the on the hands motion. Now it doesn't mean that more modern interpretation of Suwaliwaza are necessarily wrong, and you can develop great things about Suwaliwaza. Even though I would question the 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 actually effect on the knees, but yes. it's not because historically this is not the historical answer that another meaning which has been ascribed is necessarily wrong, as long as it's justified. But when people ask me, sorry, was that why? I explain, well, my point of view is historical. And uh, there are many ways to be uh, pertinent. My pertinence is historical. Uh, there are other ways to be pertinent, and, and, and that's okay. But it's uh, as long as you know that, uh, I think we can have a discussion, we can have a conversation. And you can, we can leave and still do what we were doing, but at least we understand our, each other's practice better. Yes. Yes, I think that's important. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing and um, chatting with, with us in the Aikido Journal community today. Um, if, if people want to learn more about you or, or take a look at some of your, your videos or your interviews, where should they go? Uh, so there is my uh, website. So my name is horrible to spell, but uh, I, I, <laughs> hopefully you'll have a link. Uh, we a will. Link we'll there. have a link in the show notes. Um, yes. And uh, I think most people uh, might find an interest in my Aikido channel. Uh, why? Because it contains a lot of the uh, interviews I've done with uh, a lot of uh, uh, Aikido teachers, Japanese and 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 uh, and, and, and uh, non-Japanese. And, and more than uh, than anything else, I think is the is the words of those guys that we really need to preserve and to record, um, so that we can actually base our own research and our own thinking on something tangible, because information gets lost. And we are at an age of information, but information gets lost very very quickly. And uh, that's that's why I think you know Aikido Journal, of course, uh, is, a, is a is a major thing for Aikido. Without without that, very few of us will actually be having any conversation at all. And uh, so you know, I do what I can. I'm in Japan. I've got access to some teachers for some reason. Most accept to talk to me, so that's uh, that's nice, and I, and I put it out. Well, thank you, and I'm I'm certainly very thankful for everything that you do for the Aikido community. And now that Stan Prannon has has passed on. You know, that's one one less person that has that depth of historical knowledge and the drive yeah. to, to do the research and to document this stuff. And so I'm, I'm very happy to have you as part of the community and uh, as a major contributor in this in this area. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Aikido Journal podcast. If you find our work valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can share it on social media, join the discussion on our blog, or you can support us directly by subscribing to Aikido Journal TV, a membership that gives you on-demand access to our video library, new digital gift boxes each month, and other perks. Then there's the Aikido Journal Academy, which produces special events and online courses. All these things and more you'll find on our website at aikidojournal.com. And again, thank you for your support. It's an honor to serve the Aikido community.